board trustee, class of 2001, and founder of Digital Remedy, has sponsored this competition with $475,000 in total prizes. Thank you, Mike, to your support of student entrepreneurship at Hofstra. So the Center for Entrepreneurship was founded in 2015, and we took over management of the challenge when we were founded and launched. And we've developed an entrepreneurship training program around the challenge um, and the competition series, including the Hofstra Digital Remedy Lion's Dens, business boot camps, workshops, assistance from experts, and mentorship for students with experienced entrepreneurs and residents. This spring semester alone, the students participating in the competition participated in 110 mentor sessions to prepare for, the, for today and for developing their business. Um, and with the Idea Hub Incubator, we're able to take our assistance to the next level, offering space and services to students and alumni who will continue with their businesses. So I would like to introduce our judging panel today, um, Mike Seaman. Uh, CEO of Digital Remedy, board trustee, and chair of the Center for Entrepreneurship Advisory Board. Digital Remedy is a digital media solutions company leading the tech-enabled marketplace, and he co-founded this company as an undergraduate college student at Hofstra University. Um, digital Remedy is formerly known as CPXI and has been included on Inc. Magazine's list of fastest growing privately held advertising marketing companies in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2014, and 2015. Mike was selected as a semifinalist in Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year Initiative in 2010 and 2013, and as a finalist in 2019 and 20, uh, uh, sorry, 2009 and 2014. And he was recognized by the American Marketing Association, receiving their prestigious Four Under 40 Award in 2015 and the Smart CEO Future 50 Award in both 2015 and 2017. His philanthropic, philanthropic initiatives include sitting on the boards of the Hebrew Educational Society Nonprofit Community Center and Supporting Children International, where he spearheaded the development of community centers in both Ecuador in 2010 and Colombia in 2014. Thank you, Mike, for all you do. <clears throat> we also welcome Noelle Goddard, principal at the Accelerate New York Seed Fund. Noelle evaluates and performs diligence on applicant companies and their technologies for the Accelerate New York Seed Fund. Prior to her role at Accelerate NY, she directed the formulation R&D for Symbiotic Health, a New York City-based startup company focused on oral drug delivery of cellular, cellular and biologic therapeutics for diseases in the lower GI tract. She founded a food safety diagnostics company in Calverton, New York, and worked with Sapling Learning, a STEM educational software startup acquired by Macmillan Learning. She obtained her PhD from Rockefeller University and postdoc at Harvard Medical School as a fellow in the Society of Fellows and served as an assistant professor of physics at Hunter College, CUNY. And Noelle has been very helpful to us with her networks with the New York City Long Island Entrepreneurial Ecosystem. Thank you so much for being here today. Our next judge is Robert Hussey, member of the Board of Directors of Digital Remedy and a member of the Center for Entrepreneurship Advisory Board. Bob is a seasoned financial, marketing, and operations executive in sectors including packaged goods, financial services, and advertising. In recent years, Bob has focused on advising private equity and institutional investors in these industries. And his accomplishments include a NASDAQ IPO and ultimate sale to News Corp of Pop Radio Corp, uh, under which Bob's leadership became the country's largest direct broadcast satellite network. He received his MBA from George Washington University and currently serves on the Board of Regents at Georgetown University, where he received his undergraduate undergraduate degree, and Bob is a real help to student entrepreneurs at the Center for Entrepreneurship and rolls up his sleeves with them, and we really appreciate his assistance and insight. Thanks for being here today. <laughs> and last but not least, I'd like to introduce Kara Longworth, Long Island Regional Director of Empire State Development. Um, Carol Longworth started in this position in February 2015. Empire State Development grows Long Island's economy, it encourages business investment and job creation through loans, grants, tax credits, real estate development, and marketing, and she coordinates 
the efforts of the Long Island Regional Economic Development Council, a body of business, government, academia, and community focused on recommending economic development strategies for the region and seeking funding. President Rabinowitz is co-chair of this council, and over the past years, the council has resulted in $639 million for 791 projects on Long Island. And the Idea Hub is a beneficiary of some of that funding, as well as the Behavioral Market Research Lab in this building. And we are now part of the New York State Business Incubator Program through Empire State Development as well. Miss um, Longworth was previously an assistant district attorney in the Nassau County District Attorney's Office, executive director of the Glen Cove Industrial Development Agency, and chief financial officer of the Nassau County IDA. Thank you for being here today. I'd like to make a few quick acknowledgements. Um, thank you to our entrepreneur in residence team, an amazing team of entrepreneurs, investors, corporate executives, who have really um, worked closely with the teams you'll be seeing today. So Peter Kestenbaum, thank you. Barbara Roberts. Chris Lapinto. Um, Kevin Hesselberg couldn't be here today. And um, DJ Nomo Robo, Aaron Foss, thank you. <laughs> Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Dean Janet Lenahan of the Frank Zarb School of Business, our roommate <laughs> here in the new School of Business building. Thank you so much. And also the team at the Center for Entrepreneurship, Sharon Goldsmith, Senior Associate Dean, <laughs> Laura Fetter, Assistant Dean, April Jones, Program Coordinator, and our student assistant, Alec Marcus. And our other two student assistants are floating around. Jonathan's in the makerspace, Jonathan Montag, and Sadidra's in the back, Sadidra Harris. Okay, before we get started, I just want to invite Mike Seaman up to welcome you and say a few quick words. So just want to welcome everyone. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, everyone who's a part of the competition, all the judges, all the entrepreneurs and residents. Obviously, thank you, Stuart Rabinowitz, um, as well as the Board of Trustees and everyone at Hofstra University that's made this possible. Um, we've done it for a, a lot of years now. I think this is seven. Um, and it's been pretty awesome every year. And I think the students um, have really had a, a great time participating and working to really establish a business, get ready to pitch and understand how to do things. Um, every year it's always difficult to get to the final 10, but we do it. Um, and we hope that all the people who didn't make it really work hard and continue to pursue their passions and their life of entrepreneurship, because it really is a long-term struggle to really become an entrepreneur. You have first ideas, second ideas, third, et cetera. When I was here, we didn't have these programs. That was part of my desire to want to create this. Um, for other entrepreneurs to really be able to build and grow just like I had as an undergraduate because it wasn't easy when I did it. It's still not easy to do even with programs like this, but this helps you, you know, get mentorship and other things uh, involved in the uh, center and the Idea Hub. So just good luck. Um, this is your first time pitching, your second time pitching, your third. You're going to do it for the rest of your lives most likely if this is your passion and this is what you want to do. So don't be discouraged. Have fun. Be comfortable. Um, and let's, uh, let's do the best we can. So congratulations. OK. So a few logistical details. This is being live streamed right now. If For the live stream to pick you up, you have to talk into the microphone. So you could take the microphones. You could walk around with them, but talk into the microphones. Judges, the same thing when you're ask, asking your questions. So there will be 10 teams pitching today. They will each have five minutes to give their pitch and three minutes to answer judges' questions. Alec will have the timer. Just signal to Alec when you're ready to start. Um, the pitches will cl conclude about 1.30. The judges will deliberate to choose the top three winners, which will be announced about 2 p.m. There will be pizza in the back for you and music to enjoy while the judges are deliberating. Um, so first place today is a $42,000 prize package, second is a $21,000 prize package, and third is an $8,500 prize package. 
And no matter what the results are today, you are all very talented, phenomenal students. You've worked really hard. And at the Center for Entrepreneurship, we will continue to support you. And this, even when you graduate, the services here will still be available to you. So um, we'd love to have you as a tenant of the new Idea Hub, too. OK, I think we're ready. <laughs> so our first um, team student that's pitching is Tania Speaks, from the founder of Brow Boost. In elementary school, you were probably trying to be the first one on the swings at recess. Me too. Until I was bullied for having thick, bushy, unruly eyebrows. And I hated my brows. But the torture of my peers pushed me to find a solution. Brow Boost was born. I turned my trauma into triumph. Actually, have you looked at your brows today? Did you love them, hate them, or even forget about them? You are not alone. I am Tania Speaks, 17-year-old founder of Brow Boost, an organic eyebrow gel made from the aloe vera plant and vitamin E that tames thick brows and grows thin brows. My mission is to make brow boost a part of women and adolescent girls' grooming routine who need a little help redefining how they feel about their brows. I am not discouraged by my competitors because there are limited organic brow gels on the market that do not contain harsh chemicals and they are not animal cruelty free. So why should you believe in Brow Boost because of Ray. Our patent pending formula is reliable, affordable, and easy to use. Dry brush your brows with your brow wand, apply gel to your brow wand, and brush upwards and over. We will reduce this to one step using an automatic brow wand that will accurately brush brows to stimulate faster hair growth results. We are blending technology, innovation, and beauty in one battery operated package. The best part of Brow Boost is that it works. Customer A, needed a full brow rehab, and she experienced results within two months by applying Brow Boost twice a day. Customer B needed to fill in sparse areas of her brows and experienced results within one month by applying Brow Boost twice a day. Customer C just needed a taming of her wild brows. And finally, customer D, fills in her brows with a brow pencil and applies brow boost on top. My revenue streams are generated from direct and online sales, trade shows and wholesaling, resulting in a 90% profit margin and $10,000 after expenses my first year. Last year, with a slight increase in price, my profit margin grew to 94%, and I haven't lost a customer. And we are on the road to a million. Let me tell you how. In 2018, I was featured in Forbes, Black Enterprise, The Root, and named one of Time Magazine's most influential teens of 2018. 
which skyrocketed our sales by 70% all in one year. Based on our projections, we will increase this margin with social media influencer reviews with at least 100,000 followers, 60-day subscription boxes, retailers, and additional features. We anticipate a 10% increase in expenses each year, which will include manufacturing, packaging, filling, storage, influencers, and staff. Social media influencers are the new word of mouth, and they, their reviews can average from $2,500 to $20,000. As a teen startup, I have stretched pennies to make dollars, and I will stop at nothing to turn those dollars into millions. When you look good, you feel good. Uh, very good presentation, thank you. Thank um, you. I just wanted to go back to something that you were pitching as one of your features. So you said you have a patent pending formulation. Could you please yes. explain what's actually protectable in your formulation? Yes, so we are patent pending our design patent, and then we also have a utility patent for our formula. And by design, you mean? Our logo, our brand, everything, so they can't steal our design. Okay, and then the, the second piece of that, so the the elements which you're talking about, which are in your, your natural product, right? Yeah, so, so we tell customers what the ingredients are so they are aware. However, we have a trade secret on how much of olive oil we use and how much vitamin E, so we have a utility. Okay, product. so it's formulation. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so the, you, um, you have some big growth from 2018 to 2019. Yep. Um, Curious how much of that was realized so far since we're already in Q2 of 2019 and um, where you see that big jump coming from. From 2018 to 2019? Yeah. So in 2019, um, I was featured in Forbes and that kind of started all of the features coming after that. And then I had The Root and Black Enterprise and then Time Magazine. And a lot of my sales came from those features. And then also my sales came from word of mouth because when I'm at events and trade shows, I'm known as the brow girl. And so when they start telling their family and friends about me, they go to my website and they're like, I'm going to try it too. My brows won't grow. And so I saw a big jump from 2018. My first feature was in August up until 2019. So what, what were your revenues so far year to date, I guess, compared to 2019? So my first year, it was $10,000. The next year, it was $17,000. And starting 2019, we've made about $1,500 each month. change as you get bigger. I yes. assume um, you're making them now yourself at home and you're eventually going to look for a manufacturer or a co-packer? So right now we co-share a lab in Baltimore, Maryland, and that's where I make the formula and I make it in batches. However, we want to go to the automatic brow wand and then we will need a manufacturer and that will actually work better for us so they can fill it and we don't have to do it ourselves. So then when we have more traction, we're not trying to fill all of those brow boosts ourselves. Hi, um, great presentation. Uh, I thought your focus was excellent. Um, I liked your confidence and your history with the brand. Uh, the one question I had was, as I'm very much a product guy, uh, from a formulation standpoint, have you had any testing done of it by an outside laboratory? No, so when I started it, it was kind of just on the whim. Um, and so I started testing it on my family and friends first. Um, and they experienced results, but of course I still had doubts because they were my family. Yeah. So then that's when I started testing it on customers. So their testimonials are what I um, basically tell other customers about. So I show them the testimonials and I say, you know, results will vary, but if you try it, send us in your results. 
So I haven't had it tested by a lab, but I use my testimonials. Great. I think that should be in your business plan that your that your expectations are that once you get to a certain level of sales or beyond your product development that you're capable of, that you get to a third party. Because the, um, the kind of halo or the endorsement of that third party will really help drive your sales and give you a lot of credibility in the marketplace. A lot of people look for references to products. They compare it, as you said, from your competitive landscape comments. They look to see whether or not there's a third party validation of your formula that it won't, you know, cause a allergic reaction to them. Yeah. You know, across all kind of skin tones and skin types. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you. Great job. Okay, next is Cordalytics. Marcus Smith and Jan Leitner. So in case you didn't know, private tennis lessons in Long Island are very expensive. On average, a private tennis lesson costs about $120 an hour, and it doesn't really come with any type of statistical analysis. So here at Quarterlytics, we are providing statistical, technical, strategic, and mental feedback for our clients through video analyzation, as well as incremental business opportunities for indoor tennis clubs on Long Island, all of which have cameras set up at their facilities so that we can refer our clients there so they can have their matches easily recorded. Who are we? This is Marcus, I'm Jan. We're both D1 student athletes here on the Hofstra men's tennis team. We have a lot of experience in being tennis lessons to young professionals who would like to play collegiate tennis in the future. So our three-step process is as follows. The client will send us a match video in which we will record the statistics using a advanced Microsoft Excel software that Jan here has created. Then we evaluate the obtained statistics and use the eye test to determine what kind of strategic, technical, and mental feedback we can give to the client. Then the performance report is created using a statistical analysis sheet, the visual diagrams, and live video footage taken directly from the match, as well as situational awareness points that provide mental strategy that the client can go back to any time. Uh, sorry, at any time. The performance report is then delivered as a PDF or PowerPoint dependent on the client's choice. This is an example of the automated software that we use in order to record the stats. All we pretty much have to do is click a button right here, and then it creates those diagrams for us that visualize the data, and it really helps us to provide quality feedback to our clients. So pictured here is the PDF version of our performance in court, uh, including a situational awareness point as well as live video footage taken directly from the match. So our target market are these 75 indoor tennis clubs on Long Island, all of which have cameras set up on court at the facilities, as well as over 8,000 teenage tennis players on Long Island. Regarding our competition, we listed our main three competitors here, Game Smart Tennis, Scissor Tennis, and Private Tennis Coaches on Long Island. Regarding the way we differentiate ourselves from our competition, first of all, through a product offering. So we offer a full analytical and performance report priced at a rate of $100, whereas our main competitors, in this case, it's Game Smart Tennis, offer the same product at a rate of $150 per report. And as Marcus mentioned, we offer incremental business opportunities to local indoor tennis clubs here on Long Island because we refer our, our clients to those indoor clubs, all of which have cameras set up. So clients book the courts, they record the matches, and the recordings are going to be sent directly to us to get analyzed. Regarding our revenue model, so from the first year of operation, we would like to acquire at least 250 clients. We calculate our annual maximum capacity to be around 900 performance reports per year. And we believe that on average, a client will purchase about three performance reports per year. 
Therefore, within the first year of operation, our annual sales are going to amount up to $70,000. However, keep in mind that once we start outsourcing the performance report creation to fellow student athletes, uh, these numbers are all going to go up. So, assuming that, as Jan just mentioned, that a client will want to do three reports per year, that means they will have to make three two-court hour reservations per year. And an average court cost on Long Island costs about $80 an hour. So that leads to about $120,000 worth of generated revenue for an indoor club on Long Island. And of that, we would only take 15%, resulting in $18,000 additional revenue for Courtalytics. This table shows our cost within the first year of operation. So notice apart from the Microsoft Office license, phone plans, and website operations, we don't really have any greater costs. Therefore, our profit margin is going to be relatively high of about 98%. So in terms of scalability, we would like to grow our business by outsourcing performance support creation to fellow student athletes, the guys on our team, as well as other collegiate tennis players. We would pay them about $15 an hour. And since the average report takes about three and a half hours to complete at the moment, we would result in 50% profit for us too, as we would take 50% of the $100. And this allows for more reports and increase our capacity for more courts, uh, reports to be created per year, resulting in additional revenue. So pictured here is Karan. Karan has been, a, uh, I've been coaching Karan for about two years now, and he became a Cordalytics client earlier this year, and he loved the report that we gave him, and he will be back soon. So in the future, we would like to partner up with indoor tennis clubs on Long Island so that we can refer our clients there to have their matches recorded in exchange ask for 15% of the generated revenue as well as free advertising at the clubs and on the websites. We would also like to purchase our own equipment so that we can record matches and practices for our client when the outdoor season comes around. We would also like to advance our software so we can obtain more in-depth statistics as well as record them more quickly and more efficiently. And we would also like to contribute to other sports besides tennis. Thank you. Thanks for the nice presentation. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to understand better the scaling process. So I, I get how you can scale in Long Island, because right now you have connections here, which you're trying to leverage in order to get the initial amount of traction. But right now, the scaling problem comes down to you having enough people to actually analyze the videos. And if you want this to go bigger than Long Island, how does that work? Have you thought about this yet? I guess, so first of all, we would fo focus on Long Island pretty much. Um, as we said, Marcus has a lot of uh, customers here. I play with a lot of customers. And I guess we will use those contacts to uh, just, yeah, go bigger. S since it is a digital firm, uh, basically, you know, we're doing it all online. We have a website set up. So people, through uh, word of mouth, people in tennis community are very well connected and people will find out soon enough. Uh, our competitors have done the exact same thing. So we believe that this is a viable uh, option for us. So all the other competitors also do visual analysis by hand of, of everything, or there's actually some visual uh, so, software on the background that automatically identifies the metrics you're talking about? So there's currently n just one software that exists. It's one company. Marcus can explain, but explain it a little bit further. But all other companies outsource uh, that process. So what they do is they have people who watch the videos. So they get the videos, they watch the videos, they record the, uh, the statistics per hand, and then they provide the... Well, that's, yeah. Yeah, so our competitors outsource to countries like India and China. And what we plan on doing is instead using the collegiate students, uh, collegiate athletes here. And I'm sorry, what was the other question? Uh, it was about whether other companies actually used software to automatically analyze the videos as versus human labor. Yes, there is a company that does do that. There's only one company. It's called PlaySight. So what they do is they have uh, these about seven cameras set up on a court. They're very rare because they're very expensive. And they record the stats and the analysis of the match live. So there's no actual software that where you can just put in a video and have it automatically analyze. Thank you. I, I'd like line of questioning, uh, and I, I apologize, I don't play tennis and I don't know about tennis, so, um, but is, is, is it a standalone report when the, when the athlete gets the report from you, they don't need a coach or some other professional to interpret for them, they can just look at it themselves and understand just from the report how to make their game better, or do they need, or, or is it a tool for coaches to then further help their athletes. So we see it as a substitute for coaching because we believe that our reports are extremely in-depth, far more than our competitors. So a report is about, our report was about 10 pages long. 
uh, for a client and they can retain it also. So we view it as more of a substitute to coaching. So it's pretty much based, we take the statistics and we grade uh, the performance report based on those statistics or so the feedback, whatever we see. A coach can't really record statistics. A coach can only tell you about your, te your, your, your uh, technique. Your technique, exactly. So we go further and provide tactical advice and strategic advice. So when you say s statistics, it's like every time your foot's in this place, the ball, like what, what is the statistic? So, for instance, first serve, it's percentage. Where you serve, where you place your first serve, what do you do after the uh, after your serve or you place your return? All these statistics that yeah, very nerdy that. tennis stuff. Yeah. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Next up, Michael Lai with Cress Health. Hi, my name is Michael Lai, and I'm the founder of Crest Health. Imagine that you're a 30-year-old woman living on Long Island who has just completed an addiction treatment program. Your addiction has isolated you from your closest relationships, leaving you lost, alone, and helpless. In hope of finding support, you attend your local Alcoholics Anonymous, but when you walk in the room, you find that you're the only woman of color. This one story is part of a nationwide epidemic that has ravaged our communities. Addiction is now the number one cause of death for Americans under the age of 50 and costs your society nearly $1 trillion every single year. Receiving social support is a necessary step towards maintaining sobriety. However, a staggering 85% do not receive adequate social support post rehab under currently available options. Why is this the case? We've identified three key limitations with current support problems. First, in-person meetings are not accessible if you work full-time or live in a remote location. Second, members feel like they don't belong. Most of these programs are demographically homogenous and can exclude underrepresented populations. And third, emergency support is not there when needed the most. During social support, you can change the tide of recovery when someone needs it the most. To address these limitations, we developed the Crest Solution, a mobile platform creating personalized support communities post rehab. There are three components to our platform. First, first, Crest connects you to a personalized online support group that matches you based on key identities. Second, Crest provides a safe space that allows you to share your experiences anonymously and risk-free. To ensure a safe space, Crest employs an artificial intelligence AI system that monitors communities for malicious or inappropriate behavior. And third, Crest connects you to emergency support when you need the most. Through the SOS or send over support button, a member can receive instantaneous support in their greatest time of need. The Crest solution was developed under the guidance of our three clinical advisors who have validated that this approach will be effective in a clinical setting. We surveyed the competitive landscape and found that we are the only solution that incorporates all three elements of emergency support, safe space, and personalized support groups. With 4 million people, 40 million people battling addiction and 3 million people leaving rehab each year, there's clearly a lot of people who need the help. How are we going to do this? We're going to partner with treatment centers. The Crest application will be integrated into the existing treatment package of each treatment center. And as part of this package, each center will pay a $10 monthly subscription fee for each of their outgoing members to use our platform. This yields a revenue opportunity of $400 million in the initial phases alone. Meanwhile, the SaaS nature of our business allows us to maintain low operational costs and a margin greater than 80%, helping us achieve self-sustainability. To achieve our goal, we put together a diversely talented founding team and an expert set of business advisors with years of experience in the development of startups and of scalable digital platforms. 
We've currently completed product development and are currently in the middle of alpha testing. We're scheduling a beta test consisting of 150 patients over three treatment centers and are in talks with Phoenix House, which has branches across Long Island and the New York metro area, McLean Hospital, an affiliate of Harvard Medical School, and the Providence Center. We will then conduct a 300 patient clinical study under the direction of Dr. Haskoffler, the professor of addiction psychiatry in the Center for Alcohol Studies at Brown University, who has already agreed to supervise our study. Winning the Hofstra Venture Challenge will give us the seed funding necessary to launch this beta test and this clinical study by the summer and fall of this year. After this, we will then pursue insurance reimbursement negotiations to achieve public wide-scale rollout by, the, by year end. This is Cress, and our vision is to address a trillion dollar addiction problem. Thank you. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, I wasn't really clear on the revenue model. Yes. Uh, and I and my my next question is kind of a compound question: is okay. the the fundamental issue of addiction and compliance or um, agreement to follow this plan? Um, these people are fighting uh, right. normalcy, mm -hmm. and so I'm not sure where the money comes in and the desire for compliance with right. the program. Right, so you, like the, uh, the members, the clients, use our program. Right, so the way we've tailored this program is that we are not a digital therapeutic. We are a support system after a member has left treatment centers. So currently the situation right now is that once a member leaves the outpatient center, the treatment centers lose contact with them. They don't have the logistical capability to maintain contact with that patient. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, these patients have isolated communities and isolated relationships. And because they don't have the support system, which has been clinically demonstrated to be vital to maintain sobriety, they relapse. And unfortunately, there's a 60% rate of relapse due to this lack of racial support that we're really trying to solve here. Thank you. Uh, just to follow on, follow up with that question, I mean, how did you arrive at this price point? Because I, I think this is a big concern for people coming out of addiction centers. Right, so the, the price point is integrated into the total cost of the outpatient stay. So for example, 30 day outpatient stay could be anywhere upwards of $20,000. So this $10 price point is actually a very small portion of that. And we've discussed this based on talks with the Providence Center and these multiple treatment centers about what is a realistic price point that could be integrated into the existing treatment model. So the person who's receiving the treatment is not paying anything extra. This $10 is just being integrated into the treatment package that already exists. And however the patient pays for that treatment, whether it's through insurance reimbursements, whether it's out of pocket, that's how we also get revenue. So insurance doesn't see it as a separate service? No, insurance will service. incorporate it into the total package from a treatment center. Then after we go through clinical validation, we will engage with insurance providers to negotiate for individual insurance reimbursements. People uh, mm -hmm. battle addiction for life. Right. So this is, they would just pay one time and they'd have, it was a pen, $10 a month. But once they've separated themselves from that addiction center, how do they, what happens for the next 30 years? Right. So the vision that we envision is that basically once we can get the clinical validation, we will negotiate with the insurance providers to see how long they will be willing to support this fund. And if it's demonstrated that it can re really maintain sobriety and potentially stop the rate of relapse, and that saves a lot of money for the insurance providers later on, and that's their incentive to use and fund our program. One follow-up question, Michael. Have you done a, a, a modified P&L for the product? Do you know what your development costs are gonna be? And Right, yes. Okay, so yeah. currently, we're using a database, Firebase, and currently, every message per monthly sent is gonna cost 0 0.02 cents. So that's how we arrived at our greater than 80% margin for the business. Thanks, Michael. Up next is Elizabeth Paulina, the founder of Lynx. Hello everyone, my name is Elizabeth Paulina and I am the founder of Lynx, 
we build women track and field shoes. So I'm a senior mechanical engineering student here at Hofstra, and I'm a professional track and field athlete. Here I am at the European Championships in, in Finland. I'm here competing against a field of strong female track and field athletes. However, I am competing in men's track and field shoes because there are no women's track and field shoes available on the market. And this is a huge problem because women don't run like men. So Lynx is building track and field shoes built, made for the uh, female anatomy. We are using 3D printing uh, technology and innovative fa fabrics to uh, increase attraction, decrease the, the weight, increase more stability for the female athlete, and ultimately make the female athletes uh, run faster. How do we stand out compared to our competitors? So we set our um, products at a more attractive price. Also, we increase the traction by using innovative fabrics instead of the uh, cheap fabrics that the competitors use nowadays. And we are the only shoe that is built for female track and field athletes. So after the prototype has been done, we're going to have to run a couple of field tests. And there's already one, about 100 female track and field athletes lined up to start testing the shoe here in the Netherlands, in the Netherlands and here in the US, USA. So we're partnering with US manufacturers to produce the prototypes. The manufacturing costs are about 15 to $20 for an order of up to 10,000 pairs. Based on customer discovery, we've set the price at $100 per pair, and we give a group discount of 30%. The customer lifetime value of an athlete is $500, but we all know that athletes go faster through shoes than your, uh, they're your own kids. Therefore, the customer lifetime value can be over $1,000 when the track and field athlete uh, buys multiple shoes a year. Also, in, in, order, to, um, in order to reach five, on, 5 million sales, we only need 25,000 athletes. At 25,000 athletes, is just a small fraction of the US market. Here in the US alone, there is more than half a million female track and field athletes. And globally, the global market revenue in 2016 was 13 billion, and it will increase to almost 17 billion in 2018. 60% from this is uh, female track and field uh, shoes. All right, so our, our initial marketing strategy is to publish an article on New York Roadrunner's blog because that blog has thousands of subscribers. After our beta test has been um, successfully completed, we'll start approaching non-sponsored track and field teams here in New York and in New Jersey, and then we'll launch our Kickstarter campaign. So track and field athletes are easy to target because there's, there are Facebook group, groups with thousands, 10,000, tens of thousands of track and field athletes, and in order to scale our marketing, in order to scale our marketing, we can publish articles on a track and field websites. These websites are only targeting track and field athletes, and they attract over 40 million um, unique visitors, and these are websites only in the US and the, in the EU. So globally, it will be more. 
So initially, we like to distribute our turkey food shoes online via Amazon and via our own website. Over the long run, we like to distribute our shoes in store and via online retailers that exclusively target turkey field athletes. So I'm endorsing already one athlete who is very excited and, and very talented. And she's jumping to help me and give me advice and help me product the, the, pro, the, pro, product the, the turkey field shoes. On my team, I have two top coaches. These coaches have been uh, guiding track and field uh, female athletes to the Olympics. So they know exactly what the female track and field athlete needs to reach their full potential. So let's, let's make track and field a better world for female athletes. Thank you. Great presentation. Uh, I understand running a little bit better than tennis. So um, is there any opportunity for this for recreational runners? To this is both for professional runners and amateurs. And I have a second question. I know um, a few years ago with the swimming suits in the Olympics, they had changed. There was all sorts of rules and regulations, and they ultimately changed, had to change the swimming suits. Is there anything similar in, in Olympic rules or NCAA rules about the, the type of shoe and what yes. would be legal. Okay, so nowadays the shoes have uh, about six to eight spikes on the bottom plate. The rule is you can only have up to 11 spikes. So my design will have 10 spikes in a unique placement. Yes. Thank you. So question being that it seems like it's such a huge opportunity in terms of the scale. Um, why in your opinion, well, two part question. So one would be why in your opinion has it Nike, Puma, um, New Balance, et cetera, built the exact type of shoe for females, um, being that it's such a big market and they could own it. And two, what would it, um, why would it, would it be so difficult for them to enter the market after seeing your marketing of the female shoe? So uh, first, uh, men's track and field, uh, the sport, as, as it's more popular than women's track and field. They get more exposure. So for Nike and other brands, it's more profitable to, to make, um, Turkey food shoes tailored for men, and then they, they make uh, women's running in the same uh, shoe. They have they're available in women's sizes, but they're not made for the female body. And what was your second question again? The second question was being that that being the case, like you're saying, right? So they're, I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is they wouldn't create this specific shoe because why would they if they can just create those sizes and females would buy them? It doesn't behoove them to do the R and D to do this. But after you have done this and created that, what is gonna limit them from wanting to copy and create a female shoe once you enter the market? So after I finalize all the designing process, I will uh, patent my design. Yes. Well, my, my question is kind of echo, echo Mike's. Um, the size of the market, as I recall it, the, the, the gross market was 400,000 425,000 women, female athletes. That's in the U.S. In the U.S., just yes. the U.S. And then your your target market or your resulting market would be 25,000 of those people? Yeah, 25,000 in order to make $5 million in sales. Right, so it is a very specialized market. So to Mike's point, what you really need to be careful about is someone, some because the distribution is controlled by four players. So you're going to fight to get distribution. Um, you can go through the mom and pop shops that are want to be loyal to you or know you as an athlete or know your team members and they'll take on the brand. But um, distribution is controlled by these four major manufacturers. It, I think it might be really smart to think about um, protecting your product with licenses and patents, or excuse me, patents, and then license the concept to, um, to one of these larger manufacturers. They have all the brand power and the brand money and we, you're going to find that out. It's a very expensive proposition to market that, but you've done a great job on the uh, on the products, especially. Um, it's your experience and your love, so yeah. we can see your passion in, yeah. the, in the product, so congratulations. Yeah, thank you.
Next, we have Medaf, Jack, Jacob Hockendoner, and Adam Hussein. Hi, I'm Jacob. And I'm Adam. And we, we are MedApp. So we all have an elder family member that we love and care about a lot. And everything's going great. They're playing golf, hanging out with the family, playing with the grandkids. What happens in 10, 15, 20 years? They tend to look to nursing homes to provide the long-term care that they need. And nursing homes are really expensive. So it's important to have um, a service such as Medicaid to be able to provide the care that they need so they can continue living the lifestyle they want. Now, these Medicaid applications are incredibly complicated and they require a lot of documentation. For instance, oh, your driver's license, your birth certificate, uh, your social security card, your health insurance card, your social security uh, reward and reimbursement uh, pension letter. And finally, if that was enough, five years of bank statements. Um, and there's actually a lot more after that. We had to cut a lot of this for time because we'd be standing here for like an hour. Um, some of these documents aren't even in the hands of the family when you have to file the application. And uh, it takes an incredible amount of time to get this from the government. In fact, we calculated it out. It takes about six months to compile a Medicaid application by hand. Now, if you think that's tough, try being a Medicaid expediter in a nursing home. Come on. <laughs> Try being a Medicaid expediter in a nursing home managing 500 families, uh, 500 individual people with hundreds of documents. Um, there's only one or two expediters per nursing home if they even have them. And usually, either, if they don't have them, they outsource them to law firms, which are ex exorbitantly expensive. Um, these expediters are compiling these applications with pen and paper. They're doing it by hand. And they're lucky if they can even use Excel to do parts of this. Uh, there's a huge margin of error associated with this, clerical errors, forgotten or lost documentation. Uh, if the deadline is missed, by the way, you miss the whole month, so you don't get reimbursed for that whole month. Um, and um, you, you lose a month or two for every rejection because it takes a month for them to process the application, and then it takes a month for you to then fix all the problems that they've you know, said that you have with your application. We don't think that's right. <laughs> This is where MedApp comes in. What we do is we provide a easy to use dashboard so that nursing homes can get a overview of what, where the client's status is, any missing documents or information they currently have. We also have a, we split the Medicaid process into several small simple steps to reduce the likelihood of information being forgotten, as well as provide multiple channels of document uploads such as web, fax, um, email, as well as mobile uploads and in a future update, we'd like to try to get Carrier Pigeon also. So currently on Long Island, nursing homes get reimbursed about $441 per day from Medicaid. It's about $10,000 per month. And something to keep in mind is that when a, one of their clients runs out of assets to pay for the nursing home, they can't kick them out. So however long it takes for them to get that client onto Medicaid, they're losing $10,000 per month. This is actually a problem across New York State as the average cost or the average reimbursement rate per day per bed per nursing home is about $400. So for every bed that is not filled or reimbursed, this nursing home is losing on average $10,000 a month. Our revenue stream is, there, our revenue model is actually pretty simple. Uh, it's $7,500 to $9,500 per month per location on a case-by-case -case basis considering everybody's reimbursement rate is a little bit different. Uh, this is actually just under the cost of one bed per year. Um, so if you get somebody on Medicaid with MedApp, you're actually paying it back within the first month of them being on Medicaid and reimbursed. So in New York State currently, there's 695 nursing homes. A 15% uh, market share of that uh, market would be about 104 nursing homes with a projected revenue of over $12 million a year. Our go-to-market strategy is B2B. Uh, there's actually a database online with every single nursing home in New York State 
provided by New York State with their accurate phone number and contact information so we can just get right in contact with them. We also plan on doing uh, like extended care trade shows with uh, brand activation marketing to explore new opportunities and new markets in the future. We're currently in contact with Meadowbrook Care Center, A. Holly Patterson, Nassau Rehabilitation and Nursing Center, and the Amsterdam at Harborside, and all of these nursing homes have agreed to beta test our product when the beta test launches in June. Me and Jacob have previous experience working on the application in the Medicaid field, uh, as well as we have a lot of experience in software engineering and um, elder law applications, which we feel gives us the edge. We also have an advisor, Luis DeVito, who is a subject matter expert in elder law and has advised us on the Medicaid process. We also have a, an advisor, Professor Ray, here at Hofstra, who has enterprise web development experience, who's helping us with compliance um, and et cetera. Thank you. I just want to understand your value proposition a little bit. Would you say, say you're like a TurboTax for Effectively Medicare? project slash uh, client contact management or like TurboTax for, for Medicaid applications. So, and, so the, and, and you sell the program to the, the nursing, nursing home. homes and then they still have to work with the client to get all the information, however. Our goal is to make that easier by including multiple channels of, of um, document providing because effectively the only thing that you need to provide is like basic information and then all this documentation there's only like one nursing home and one of the ones that we're in contact with there's only one nursing home that actually does the document recovery themselves usually it's it falls on the family to provide the, that documentation um, and one of the major pain points is getting that documentation from the family um, and so we're providing like every channel that we possibly can we're working with Twilio to get fax and text message upload for all the documentation, you could email it, you could uh, scan it in from a scanning device like a printer. Uh, so we're working to make that as easy as possible to uh, distribute these tasks to the family in a most, the most understanding way, the, the easiest to understand way, and then they could just upload it however they want. I, I'm, I have to commend you. I, I've actually had personal experience with this situation. Yeah, so uh, have I. It's really uh, hard. Yeah. Um, my mother was in a nursing home and it cost about $15,000 a month mm -hmm. and it was chaos. But I, uh, my question is to you two individuals, which one of you is the developer? We both, we both are. are. Actually, we have two other people working with us. It, this is our senior design project. So we're, we're actually almost done with development. So you have, a, you have a, it says development is underway right now and you're going to launch in the spring. So do you have a beta product that you have out there? Uh, we're, we're, we're currently in alpha. We're going to beta. Um, it should be finished by May because that's when the projects do. So it sort of has to be finished by May if we want to graduate. Great. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, good luck. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I was actually wanting to follow up on the, uh, the document upload question because it seems to me this is a, definitely a, a ripe opportunity to make a, a camera grab app for scanning docs quickly and getting yeah. them into the system because even finding a print shop that has some type of fax capability or somebody who has a scanner at home, et cetera, is one more pain point, right? Yep. Yeah, um, we, we actually have an API that we're looking at for document upload from phones where it'll actually be able to grab the corners of the document and adjust it just like a scanner. So um, we have multiple methods. Yeah, also Twilio, when you send a fax to the phone number, it automatically converts the fax to a PDF and just emails it to us or sends it to whatever number or whatever. It's a programmatic system, so it'll just do whatever we want. Or maybe you can out, I mean, again, you could license existing stuff like in Note. Well, that API it. that I referenced prior is licensing. We would license that from another company. So one last question. For the product to perform, you really need this family interaction with the app so that they supply the documentation that's missing to have a, um, a satisfactory outcome with the product. Yes, if effectively what we'll be doing is using services like Twilio or just email to send messages to the family listing exactly what they need to do to get the documentation. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have Oak Creamery, Olivia Feldman, Catherine Stoddard, and Alicia Fleming. I know a lot about ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully they have samples. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Shark tank thing. <laughs> I was hoping you would do this today. <laughs> oh boy. All right. Oh, that's another one. <laughs>
Sorry, go ahead. While the judges are enjoying some ice cream, one of our advisory board members from the Center for Entrepreneurship has joined us, John Dragata, CEO of Sovereign Global Advisors. Thanks for being here today. Hi, my name is Olivia Feldman. This is O'Creamery. O'Creamery is an artisanal ice cream made with 100% uh, natural ingredients. We are also a sustainable company, and our sustainability shines through in our pint packaging, which is made with 100% recyclable material, as well as our scoop cups and spoons, which are 100% biodegradable. Our philosophy is combining an artisanal ice cream and the desire to help our planet, and we do that by providing our customers with 100% all natural ingredients, our community by working with the local farmers in the area, and we help our earth through our sustainable initiatives, reducing the amount of plastic that is affecting our planet. But one thing that makes Oak Creamery very unique is that our flavors can tap into your emotions. Some of our flavors include home for the holidays, casual cravings, Strictly Business, Peanut Butter Lover, Bookworm. Bookworm is our Earl Grey flavor. It gives you that feeling of wanting to curl up with a good read. Strictly Business is our coffee flavor. It's perfect when you hit that midday low and you need that boost of energy. Home for the Holidays is our cinnamon, coconut, and almond flavor. And it's that feeling of coming home and seeing the joy in your family's faces. Casual Cravings is chocolate. And it's that perfect little something to sweeten your day. And Peanut Butter Lover is giving you that feeling of nostalgia. My team is comprised of myself. I am the chief marketing officer. Alicia Fleming is our head chef. She also has six years of culinary experience, as well as a food handler's license. And Katie Soddard, who is our CFO and sous chef. We are building awareness to our market, which is millennials who are aging from 18 to 35 years old. They get to discover Oak Creamery through our sampling, through our pop-up shops, as well as our ambassadors on college campuses. We are retargeting those customers to our website and social media, and they can learn about uh, discounts as well. And they would be able to incent we are incentivizing on those followers to purchase our pints and scoops through our special offers and discounts. So where do we stand? Oak Creamery clearly stands out among the rest. We are the most unique and the most sustainable. Our revenue going up and up and up. On day one, if we sold 60 scoops, which is about 15 families, in pure profits alone, we are making $192. In one week, and for Oak Creamery, that is a four-day business week, it is over $700. In a month's time, it is over $3,000. And in a year, we'd be making almost $40,000 in pure profits. Our go to market is to start with pop-up shops at Hofstra in Queens at our coffee shop and in Westchester through a beauty salon. We then would launch at Hofstra and we'd be getting the most foot traffic through the student center. We are also negotiating currently with uh, the food truck. We then are extending to the other colleges and universities on Long Island. Uh, in total, there are 14. We then want to extend out to the rest of the Long Island community through the farmer's market. In total, there are 36 farmer's markets that we'd be working with, and this would take us from early May to mid-November, and at this point, we are selling year-round when you include the universities. With those profits, we want to invest in a food truck, and our food truck is going to be the equivalent of our brick and mortar, and then we would extend out to uh, the greater New York area. 
Once we reach the greater New York area, we want to extend our services to any special events, including anniversaries, business retreats, weddings, birthdays. If there's something we want to celebrate, we want to be there to help you host it. But the ultimate goal is to see an Oak Creamery pint up on the major shelves in places like Whole Foods, Target, Trader Joe's, and Stop and Shop. My name's Olivia Feldman. This is Oak Creamery, making the world a better and sweeter place, one scoop at a time. So that was delicious. Thank you for the samples. So glad you enjoyed. <laughs> um, so one notorious problem with all natural ice creams mm -hmm. is the stabilizer problem. So the moment that you decide to put this into somebody's commercial freezer and it uh, defrosts regularly, mm -hmm. ice crystals form, changing the palate taste. So how do you guys propose to, to deal with this problem? Jeff, you want to answer that? Um, so right now we're working on, we're talking with uh, a developer. Yeah, incubators, and there's one person, she makes um, like films, like plastic films that uh, dissolve so in water. So um, we'll have that on our pints so that um, we can lessen the, the trouble of having like ice. Yeah. <laughs> Olivia? Yes. So um, I didn't notice any uh, formulation information in terms of sugar content and carbs. We are currently uh, working with the nutritionist at the moment. Okay, so you haven't identified And we're going to meet all FDA regulations. Okay, because everyone really is focused on yes. um, sugar. Everything I see in muffins and cookies, and um, I just saw a company that makes crepes, and they're, they're actually, they have a cauliflower crepe um, and an egg white crepe. Most of the crepes are made with flour, so they're all going to this, you know, really low-carb, low-sugar content. Gluten we're not free. well. We're not and looking gluten free. Yeah. Uh, a diet ice cream. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so I was wondering what that was because that's so terribly important. So yes, uh, we're uh, actually meeting with them. Be great. <laughs> good. Good. Congratulations. Oh, it's delicious. Thank you. Maybe uh, it's the sugar. Just on the, um, you know, you had a buildup of selling one scoop to month day one, week one, month one, etc. Are those were those actuals or are those projections? So based on our customer discovery, um, we had served in the student center in uh, actually 120 scoops. Within an hour, they were gone. Uh, so we were actually in this projection. It was lower because we assumed families uh, coming in. Um, but our scoops would be the most profitable. Uh, I love I love the part of it with the guys off the chart and that because it, there's a lot of people in this and then there is Thanks so much. One more thing is you guys are walking out. You should also think about co branding for your uh, Long Island if you're going to be a Long Island launch around. So you should think about maybe co-branding with some of those bars. Yeah, so there was an ice cream person in California when I was there. No, no, we're, they're, they're the same thing. It was a natural angle and stabilizer. Next, we have Oxclo Matthew Holmes. So invasive, right? It feels great. <laughs> I am Matt Holmes, and my I'm the co-founder and CEO of Oxclo, a fitness apparel brand. So some problems with fitness apparel today is odor. When you go to work out, you leave in a wet shirt and you're smelling pretty bad. So that's a big problem people face when they're leaving. Another problem is shipping prices. Our main competitors are based in the United Kingdom. So it takes seven to 14 business days to get to the US. 
and high price points. So our solution to this was to establish a fitness, an affordable fitness apparel brand based in the United States, specializing in producing products from bamboo fabric. So if you're unfamiliar with bamboo, you might be wondering why you would want to use this. It has a lot of benefit compared to traditional fabrics such as cotton or polyester. So it's incredibly soft. It has thermal control properties. It's moisture wicking and odor control. So that goes hand in hand. It takes the sweat from the inside of your shirt, brings it to the outside and evaporates it, which reduces the odor. And antibacterial, so that goes with that as well. When the sweat moves away from your skin, it takes the bacteria away, reducing like acne. And it is UV protective. So the fitness apparel market is currently in a growth stage. In 2018, there was $174 billion of revenue generated, which is a 22% growth since 2012. And the market is estimated to reach $220 billion by 2024. So the average consumer in their lifetime spends $24.7,000 on fitness apparel, which equates to about $400 a year. So on the background, you can see our website, and this is where we're going to be selling all of our products exclusively. On our first launch, we're releasing four different items. The first is a bamboo tank top, which is $5.12 landed retail for $22. Bamboo t-shirt, $6.86 landed retail for $25. Hoodie is $9.25 landed retail for $40. And leg leggings, $6.66 landed retail for $35. So right now our target audience is 18 to 25 year old male and females. This demographic is more towards college students so they don't have higher incomes. So we're aiming to keep our prices low and we're looking for people who are consistent with physical activity and have a very fashion forward sense. So we're designing all of our products in the United States and outsourcing manufacturing to China. This leads to lower production costs and margins above 72% on our first launch. We're hoping for this number to increase on our second launch when we place higher bulk orders. We're selling products explicitly on our website and domestic delivery within three to five business days. Right now we have four ways of acquiring new customers. The first being influencers. We have four influencers at the moment, all over 25,000 followers and 10 ambassadors. Our ambassadors are incentivized 10% commission to go and sell our products. And our niche currently spends two, over two hours a day on social media, so it's a good opportunity to spread brand awareness. We're gathering email subscribers to our website. We currently have about 150 subscribers. Word of mouth, and we're running promotions. So right now, if you subscribe to our website, we offer 25% off our first official, official launch in May. Here's a little chart of our competitors. Most of them are based in the United Kingdom. On the top right, that's us. We have the most high quality and affordable apparel compared to the rest. So our advantage over our competitors is that we're the first bamboo, uh, first company to specialize in bamboo apparel. Now there is other companies that use bamboo, but they focus more on uh, casual wear. They, special, they do some fitness apparel, but the prices are a lot higher. It's much higher quality than uh, Gymshark and Nike. Quick delivery in three to five days compared to the UK companies, which takes seven to 14 days, and low cost, so we're about 10% cheaper than all competition. Here's a timeline of where we have been and where we hope to be. March 1st, we had a founding investment of $4,000. March 15th, we reached 500 Instagram followers and 150 email subscribers. <coughs> we launched our Kickstarter on Tuesday, April 9th. Since then, we've generated $800 in sales, and we're expecting to be at around $1,300 on Sunday. On May 19th is our first official, uh, first official launch. And by August 1st, we hope to have $10,000 in sales to uh, spend more on marketing, employees, and higher apparel. And we hope to attend the trade show by the end of the year. And by September 30th, we hope to release our second launch. And that's me on the right, the co-founder and CEO, and my partner, Kaman Sheikh, the co-founder and CFO. Thank you. <laughs> you know, just on the face of it, I like it. Uh, um, so it's outsourced, all the manufacturing and the product acquisitions all outsourced. 
Yeah, so these products here and everything on the website is all outsourced in a manufacturer in China. Right, and and how can you be assured of your manufacturing source and the delivery of the product? I saw your timeline is your first bulk order is in May. Yeah, well, they already started production. We ordered it about two weeks ago, so it should be here in the beginning of May, and then we're launching it hopefully May 19th. Great, great. It's about um, a 25-day process to make it, seven days to ship it. Right. Good. Congratulations. Thank you. So my question is, how do you keep your edge? So the moment that uh, one of these other fitness manufacturers notices that 100% bamboo product ends up being a great market. Uh, well, some of those companies you saw in there, I'm not going to name any names, but my uh, partner actually, like, he messaged them, like, hey, I'm new to working out. Like, what's the, why aren't you guys using bamboo? I researched that as the best. Uh, fabric. Hey, messaging them back. If we do that, we're gonna have to raise our prices, and we're gonna lose consum uh, lose consumers. Yeah. I know. I know some of those some of those brands that you mentioned do seemingly sell bamboo style stuff as well. So, and I know you explained somewhat the differences in your chart of why you're better and more competitive, et cetera. But maybe you can go into a little more detail about why, like. Lululemon's bamboo stuff is not as yeah. good as what you're doing. So, like for example, we're targeting college students, so most of them don't have a hundred dollars to go spend on leggings unless, like, their mom or dad gives it to them, or unless they're really making money. So, if you can go out and get the same quality of leggings for thirty, thirty-five dollars, you're gonna do that instead of spending a hundred dollars. Okay, next up, project projection, Seda Caracas. We're running a little bit behind schedule, just so everybody knows, um, but it's okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Is, are you guys feeling good today? That's great to hear. I'm doing pretty good, too. My name is Seda Karakis, and I'm the founder of Project Projection, virtual tools with real life results. Back in high school, I had a friend who we can call Nicole. She had mild social anxiety, but it got significantly worse when her father was diagnosed with brain cancer. Her condition got to the point where she dropped out of school and didn't leave her house for over a year. I spoke with her brother out of my worry, and he told me that she refused to seek outside treatment. I desperately wished for a way to help Nicole from her home, and it was her love for video games, along with my brother's virtual reality system, that gave me the idea to start Project Projection. It was a few years later, during an entrepreneurship course I took here at Hofstra, where I received funding from Capital One Bank, that I was able to start turning my idea into a real business. Project Projection is a unique and immersive VR program that treats adolescent social anxiety through exposure therapy. Users put on the VR headsets and experience simulated social scenarios where they're exposed to anxiety-inducing situations and are given options on how to react. While doing the necessary research, I found that there were companies that had already been using VR to treat PTSD and phobias in adults for years now. And the great news was that it worked. However, I found that there was a large demographic of potential customers that these companies had missed. Adolescents. 9.1% of adolescents in the US experience social anxiety, and 55% of them do not receive treatment. This may be due to the fact that adolescents are reluctant to get treatment because of the social stigma associated with it, but the main reason is that their family's insurance doesn't cover mental health treatment. Project Projection will capture this market by creating social anxiety treatments for adolescents and offer for individual use at home as a self-help tool. Teens who don't want or can't afford traditional treatment will be attracted to Project Projection because VR appeals to teens. 79% of adolescents find VR interesting and 71% describe it as cool, fun, or awesome, and their parents like it too. Primary research I've conducted for my business shows that 
price on privacy is the most important factor when it comes to receiving treatment for adolescents. Uh, for this reason, the individual user package will be priced at $49.99 a month, and users will be able to use four levels each month. This package will also include in-program guidance as the form of therapy. Professionals can also use project projection in their sessions to observe their patients' true reactions to events that trigger their social anxiety. They can adjust the amount of stressors in each level, which gives them the benefit of assessing their patients' true behaviors and tailoring their treatments for the best results. The professional user package will be priced at $149 a month, and professionals uh, will be able to use a program on four patients with four levels available for each. Using the funding I've received from Capital One, I've been able to start creating the demo for the first level of my program. The demo is a simulation of the first day of school in a new class. The user will answer questions asked by the teacher and will be confronted by various antagonists afterwards. After the confrontation, the user will be given two options on how they want to proceed. If they choose the correct reaction, they'll move forward, but if they choose the wrong reaction, the antagonist will escalate and will be game over. An explanation of what went wrong and why will also be given. If the user chooses all the correct reactions, they'll be rewarded at the end by making a friend in the class. The demo is set to be finished on uh, April 30th, and after testing and obtaining feedback, I plan to make the necessary adjustments by the end of June. With additional capital, I'll work to create three more le levels to have a one-month package ready. And if all goes well, I'll be able to soft launch my program by, on my website, projectprojection.com, by December of 2019. If I'm able to capture 2.5% uh, of my target market in New York through my marketing efforts, upon my soft launch, I'll make nearly $300,000 in revenue that I will then reinvest in my company. None of this was possible alone, though. I've had the pleasure of working with many wonderful people throughout this journey, and I'm extremely grateful for the time, knowledge, and experience that they've shared with me, and I look forward to working with them in the future. My goal is to have at least 100 levels developed for social anxiety, and once I have, I'd like to begin developing treatments for other mental health disorders that affect teens as well. It is my hope that Project Projection's future will be, able to, will be to help all teens, like my friend Nicole, with, with a variety of mental health issues in order to make them healthier, but most importantly, happier. Once again, my name is Seda Karakis, and this is Project Projection. Very nice presentation. Um, I'm Thank I'm you. curious. I'm I'm thinking of a the fact that a lot of people who have social anxiety who may drive them into being gamers anyway actually avoid social situations because they understand the interaction with others through role playing games, etc. is a safer space. Yes. So 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 in general, how does this emulate the real situation if they already know that this is a game, so to speak? Well, this is a way for them to experience a situation in a safe space, like at a safe environment. So there won't be any actual negative consequences. So they can test out how they want to act, how they want to be, and they can gain the confidence from this to be able to go out into those spaces in the real world. Can you just uh, give us a little bit about, I guess, your background and sort of why you are the right person to develop this, the people that you've gotten involved from a clinical perspective? Okay, um, well, I myself have a little bit of social anxiety and um, I can relate to a lot of the people and how they suffer through this. Um, it's taken me a long time to be able to get up here and do something like this. Um, I've been working with uh, Ginger Fakos, who is a social worker and she's been helping me with some of the um, interpersonal relationship aspects of the program. And I also have a de developer, um, Justin Pasek, who's been developing the uh, more VR aspects of the program. Any other questions? No, it's very well done. Your presentation was excellent. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. OK. Up next, the collective, Lynn Luong and Kevin McCormick. And we have some seats over here in the front who, for anyone who, want to sit, who wants to sit down.
We're all looking for love. You guys know Bumble, right? The dating app? Well, let's take Lynn. She's 22, has some dating experience, and isn't exactly sure what she's looking for. I definitely don't want that. <laughs> or that, or that. What, what does finance guy even mean? Well, you get it. <laughs> well. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, I do want this because it's a dog. I mean, he's an entrepreneur, so clearly. Not so fast. <laughs> you never know what people are lying about. No way. Okay. Hmm. Not love at first sight, but I do love a guy that knows what he wants in five years. Well, Lynn, I hate to break it to you. If you think finding love is hard, you've obviously never looked for a career. Employers go on bad dates constantly. In fact, 45% of employers report having troubles finding the right match. That number is higher than it's been in over a decade. Who are the matchmakers currently? LinkedIn, Indeed, recruitment firms, which just pair you up with a bunch of randoms and then leave. And I end up with nothing? Well, you could have been nicer to me. Finding a great career shouldn't be as hard as finding love. There's a huge problem out there. High quality candidates and great careers just aren't swiping right on each other. We're the collective, the future of staffing. We train and recruit top candidates and work with employers in order to create an onboarding process that makes sense for the position that they're hiring. We have three staffing methods. Professional development workshops, what we call 2.0 works, are hosted by our advisor network. Members of the collective pay a 20 to $50 ticket fee in order to attend. For employers who are looking for candidates' skills in action, Rather than a static resume, we offer project-based hiring, which makes use of employers' uh, contract work. Both of these efforts contribute to a candidate's hiring potential, and employers will pay an 8% recruitment fee on any direct hire from the collective. We launched last year after a year of development. Here's a quick snapshot of the first ever cohort. 70% of them went to top 10 schools and had previous experience from companies like Goldman Sachs, Google, and Elle Magazine. Okay, there we go. Never mind. I think they are getting it. Sorry. Sorry about that. Here's a look at our advisor network and the companies that they come from. These are industry professionals who are looking to give back, helping to form the next generation of young professionals. Our current advisor count sits at 58, and we're still growing. Our launch strategy was completely organic. Between social media, advisor referrals, alumni networks, we were able to reach 10,000 impressions within the first 15 days of launching. And our clients weren't so bad either. We closed the summer with a revenue of $83,000 and a net profit of 6%. That was just in three months. We're looking to penetrate the $146 billion US staffing market, a market which outsources 39% of all its staffing needs. It's estimated that to onboard and train a new employee costs employers $240,000. And even after spending all that money, there's still a risk that a bad hire's first year salary, 30% of that could be lost. We penetrate this market with a digital and in-person push. We're leveraging our growing network to attract great candidates and optimize our brand in order to bring in employers for our hiring pipeline. After year two, we project a revenue of $254,000. Since round one of Digital Remedy, we've been conducting interviews with top executives from companies like Jobcase, Quip, and Chariot Solutions. Our objective was to understand the current hiring landscape and how they're currently dealing with it. Biggest takeaways were that companies are miscommunicating job descriptions and driving away great candidates. And technical skills, everyone can find them, but we need to refocus on soft skill training. We also have double the number of applications for people looking for acceptance into the collective. And that's why we're here. Having access to an office space where we can build our company mission, company culture, and help our candidates with their professional development is something that's huge to us. Kind of hard to work when you don't have a place to go. We are currently looking to expand the collective, and we know just how big it is based on our team in place. 
the two heads of our advisor network, a former HBO VP and a computer science and engineering professor, help us to navigate what employers are looking for and build a continuing education curriculum to do so. And us? Well, we've had great jobs, but we've been struggling for the past four years to find a place that could leverage our jack of all trades learning style. We realize that this is it, professional matchmaking, and people are looking for it. Every employer asks for ask this on an application, but this is what they're saying about us. So let us, the collective, help you fall in love with your career. We apologize. For yeah, sorry the, about that. <laughs> our presentation is very time sensitive. Yeah, it was a bit sensitive. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, when you say you're training people, what does that mean? Uh, and is, it, is are we talking just in the professional fields or manufacturing? And uh, I'm a little unclear of, it's not, it seems like you're trying to be both a matchmaker and training and onboarding. So our process is that we look for the hiring potential in candidates. Whoever gets into the collective, we match them with advisors that are already there, and they go through mock interviews to help them craft a professional development curriculum that makes sense for them. So that could mean you know, someone who's in supply chain would be matched with someone who's in supply chain. Um, and then they would take a la carte uh, workshops that are held by these professionals in order to strengthen their development. So you're not placing people in jobs? We are. The end goal is to place them in jobs. Could you flip to... So this is our process. Um, we have three different products, as we told you, and ultimately we get them into the hiring discovery and offboarding. So for example, with project-based hiring, a lot of employers want to see the actual product instead of just looking at a static resume. So you're able to take their contract work that they already need to be done and actually see who's going to be good at it. We actually had 10 of our last year's co's hired onto four different companies. Is the 8% model a standard in the industry for, for recruiters? So the 8% model is roughly um, a standard. It kind of varies from 8 to 12%. Um, but yeah, so 8% is, is within that standard range. And it's just year one. After that, it's gone. So it's, yeah, just on the first year salary. But they do stay on to the collective. It's a big social network for you to come back and continue learning. Because as we know, college, you know, that's a lot of money, but for us, it's twenty to fifty dollars to continue learning. So, is the collective the concept here is just a really a, a, a very distinct um, professional coaching program and training program to get these people ready for jobs? Sort of, but it also works with mid-level positions as well. Um, a lot of people will change jobs and change careers, and in the interviews that we've had, they actually really need something that will take that kind of onboarding and continuous training away from them. So we think of it as making you a better career builder, better worker, and better person. Okay, great job to everybody rolling with the technical difficulties we're having, we're having too. Um, our last but not least, Whitney Coleman from WC Artistry. My name is Whitney Coleman, and I handcraft jewelry and accessories that build cultural bridges and use ecocentric designs. Now, several years ago, I worked in Accra, Ghana for an international school. While there, I noticed the vibrant colored fabrics that my colleagues and students would wear, and I realized that my plain colored wardrobe was pretty boring. That's when I began shopping for vibrant colored jewelry of similar quality and beauty in the US. But what I found was either too heavy too expensive or of lesser quality. 
That's when I developed the solution to take the vibrant colored fabrics I had seen in Ghana, infuse them with sustainable materials, and created my own jewelry and accessories company, WC Artistry. All products are handcrafted and create value for customers in three specific ways. The designs are unique, the products are extremely lightweight, and the handcraftedness ensures the best quality. Also, customers have the freedom to customize their jewelry and accessories any way they'd like. Also, the prices are very reasonable, ranging from six to $35. Now, my target market are college students, young adults, and working professionals. The costume jewelry market is currently valued at over $30.2 billion, is rapidly growing, and is much larger than my current ability to produce. However, WC Artistry Scaling Plan is designed to create a $360,000 business within a year's time, which we will soon discuss. So we conducted a survey, a five-minute survey with 50 participants in order to understand customer trends in the jewelry and accessories market. We found that the three most important factors that customers consider when purchasing jewelry and accessories are design, price, and sustainability. WC Artistry satisfies all three trends because we have unique designs, we use sustainable materials, and our prices are consumer friendly. Now our competitors are sellers of African themed jewelry at lower price points, commonly sold on Etsy. However, these competitors often make their jewelry from beads and metals, which are often heavy, can lack versatility, and can tarnish quickly. WC Artistry products give customers the freedom to customize, are lightweight, and are durable for years to come. Now we create our products through four basic steps. First, a sustainable material like cardboard is selected. Then a fabric is chosen. Then raw materials are cut into specific designs and shapes. And finally, adhesive methods are used to create finishing touches. Now WC Artistry has a dual go-to market strategy. First, we want to sell to channel partners such as boutiques and museums. We have already sold to Brooklyn Museum and partnered with them to retail jewelry valued at $2,000. Also, we want to sell to individual customers through market strategies from Etsy, Facebook, Constant Contact, Instagram, and trade shows and craft fairs. Virtual assistants will be hired to assist us in these efforts through promotional listings, online marketing, email marketing, and influencer marketing within a budget of $1,770. Now to scale production at $360,000, WC Artistry will begin an entrepreneurial internship program called Capstones. This program will train high school girls how to create WC Artistry products and will teach them entrepreneurial skills. So if there are 12 women in the program, each young woman will be responsible for creating 25 pieces or products a week valued at $625. If each young woman does this, that's 300 pieces a week valued at $7,500. That's $30,000 a month and $360,000 a year. With the cost of goods and overhead expenses deducted, that's $215,000 in net income. Now with this scaling plan in mind, the profit margins fall in a very healthy place, from 50% to 90% for all product categories, and the cost of production and cost of goods is one to $7. Now we have substantial buyer-supplier relationships with companies such as Moonlight Supplies and Cover Buttons. However, an investment from this competition will, be, will enable us to scale. Thank you. Beautiful product, uh, nice talk. I wonder, uh, so I like very much the, the social impact angle at the end that you're doing in order to, to train people, uh, uh, young girls and 
in entrepreneurship, which I think is a very noble cause. I wonder if there's also an opportunity to brand uh, based on the artisans who make the original fabrics. Absolutely, yes. Um, so primarily where we get the fabrics from are from merchants in Nigeria and Ghana. Mm -hmm. um, and having the opportunity to also um, market them as well and, and show a little bit about how they make the fabrics and everything is something that we are looking into. Yeah, you might, you might take a look. I mean, Novica has been doing this for years with National Geographic, where they actually highlight a section of, an, of artisans who produce certain types of jewelry or products and highlight the artist in their catalog as well as the products that come from there. It's a, it might be a nice opportunity for another beach head for you. Great, thank you. So some of the, um, you know, I look at the, the projection in terms of net revenue, and I get it in terms of building the product, but my question is more if those channels that you have are Facebook, Etsy, et cetera, do you build into that margin marketing and shipping costs? Or is that just yes, raw we gross do. profit? We do uh, factor that in. So here's a, oops, sorry. Okay. So here's a one month um, revenue model projection that we have here. And the cost of expenses first is really to just give you an idea of how much it would cost to run the program for the young women. Um, and then also the marketing strategies of how much each would cost is around $1,770 that's all included, which equals to about $12,000. Um, so we take all that into consideration. Whitney, I'm glad you left this slide up. Where is the labor expense on a monthly basis in your P&L? That's the first thing I didn't see. Yes. Yeah, so um, basically, the the if the young women are to make the products for us, um, they wouldn't get paid um, per hour, but the cost would just be the expenses of the program, which include educational materials, because we will be providing them with those entrepreneurship skills. Okay, so for design, the, the designer doesn't get paid? Right, it would just be a program for high school girls, and um, the option would be to give them credit. If they have like a half-day schedule, they could be working for us that the rest of the day, and then right. um, that would be the compensation. And how about all the administrative expenses related, direct and indirect related to the business? Yes, those are included into the cost of sales expenses in Appendix A okay. in the executive summary. Thank you. You might also consider uh, establishing yourself as a public beneficiary corporation, which allows you to still have the, the for it's technically a nonprofit, but it allows you to still uh, do both your educational side and to make money on the other side to support you. Okay, let's give all of our competitors a round of applause. They did amazing. So oh, the judges are going to deliberate now. There's pizza in the back for everybody. We'll try. We know we're running a little bit behind schedule. We will try to be back as fast as possible. So see you soon. Welcome back, everyone, or welcome us back. I think you were all here the whole time. Um, so it took some time. Um, it was a lot of negotiating and deliberating on where we thought um, the presentations ended up. Everyone had a fantastic presentation. This might have been probably, I would say, the best year um, that we've had yet in terms of how quality everyone's presentation was and how everyone brought their A-game. Um, so we really went back and forth a lot on the business model and what the things we were looking at and what we were looking towards in terms, in terms of the scalability of the business, current revenue generation, um, and just the skill set and the presentation and the confidence and things like that that we looked into. So without further ado, uh, in third place, uh, Crest Health is third place. All right, uh, and now for second place, we have a drum roll. There's no drum roll. No drum roll. Brow boost. All right, and without further ado, our first place winner, Lynx.
Can I ask all the competitors to come up for a picture, please? And judges, come on. <laughs>